So if you're sensing a theme here, you're not off base. It's all scams, frauds, university, charity. In that vein, it could make sense that Trump's entire business might be run on scams as well. And that is what is alleged in today's sprawling 200-plus page lawsuit by, once again, the New York Attorney General. Today, AG Letitia James accused Donald Trump, three of his children, and his company of having, quote, engaged in numerous acts of fraud and misrepresentation in representing the value of Trump's assets. Inflated values they then used repeatedly and persistently to get more favorable loans and coverage from banks and insurers. In doing so, James said, they, quote, violated a host of state criminal laws over a period of 10 years, from 2011 to 2021. The lawsuit details more than 200 alleged false asset valuations. But here are just a couple of the big ones. There's Trump's famous penthouse apartment in Trump Tower. Nice place if you're into gilding. And at 10,000 square feet, by New York City standards, it is certainly a big apartment. But for the purposes of valuing his assets, Donald Trump claimed the apartment was three times bigger, over 30,000 square feet. And because it was so huge, a few years ago, Trump said it was worth $327 million. Trump's own chief financial officer admitted in testimony to Letitia James' office that that valuation of Trump's apartment amounted to an overstatement of, eh, quote, give or take, $200 million. Just for context here, the most expensive apartment on the market in New York City last year was listed for $169 million. Trump said his apartment was worth almost double that seven years ago. Nice try, Donald Trump. And then there's Trump's Florida Beach Club, Mar-a-Lago. To get tax breaks, Trump signed on to all kinds of restrictions on what could and could not be done with that property, which included a prohibition on turning it into residential real estate. Even under those restrictions, even under those restrictions, the club was worth a cool $75 million. But when it came time to assess its value as one of his assets, Trump pretended none of those restrictions existed, and the whole place could be developed and sold for residential use. He said Mar-a-Lago was worth not $75 million, but $739 million, literally 10 times its value. This investigation revealed that Donald Trump engaged in years of illegal conduct to inflate his net worth, to achieve, to deceive banks and the people of the great state of New York, claiming you have money that you do not have does not amount to the art of the deal. It's the art of the steel. And there cannot be different rules for different people in this country or in this state. And former presidents are no different. Letitia James said today that Trump's conduct appeared to violate not just New York law, but federal law as well, specifically laws against bank fraud. And she says there may have been tax violations as well. So she has referred the evidence to SDNY, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Manhattan, as well as to the IRS. But even if no federal charges come out of this, the New York AG has the power to impose severe consequences on Trump and his business. After all, that office already essentially shut down Trump's sham university and his fake charity. James can't criminally indict Trump, Trump, and she isn't explicitly seeking to dissolve the Trump organization the way the university and the charity were. But she is seeking to bar Trump and his children from ever running a business in New York again, to bar them from getting loans or acquiring real estate in New York for five years, and to recover $250 million in allegedly ill-gotten gains. That is no small sum. Put all of that together, and this lawsuit has the potential to put the Trumps out of business in the state of New York. Joining us once again is Barb McQuaid, former U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. Barb, thanks for staying with me. What do you make of the strength of the AG's case here? It's uh, what we have. She cites 10 years of Trump statements on his wealth. This is a, a scathing, scathing uh, document that she, uh, 220, clocking in at 222 pages. How do you, how do you, how strong is this given the sort of bar in terms of standard of proof for a civil case? It looks incredibly strong to me, Alex. Uh, this is not the Cliff Notes version of allegations. This is detailed, more than 200 pages detailing all of those fraudulent claims, some of which you just highlighted. And, you know, prosecutors love cases like this because they're built on documents as opposed to eyewitnesses. 
Witnesses can uh, fall apart later because their observations can be uh, uh, impeached, their credibility can be undermined on cross-examination. But documents don't forget and documents don't lie. If you show in one document that an asset was valued at one number and then in another document the asset is valued at another number, those inconsistencies can really only be explained by, you know, were you lying now or were you lying then? Some people steal money with guns. Some people steal money with lies. These were sophisticated schemes, but at the end of the day, it's really just about stealing money. And I think uh, the documents lay out the case in great detail. You asked about the standard of proof. In a criminal case, of course, the standard is guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, which can be a very high standard and sometimes very difficult to prove, especially when intent is an element. But here in a civil case, the standard is only preponderance of the evidence, which is just 51 percent. And so with that standard and this detail and those documents as evidence, I like her odds. Thank you.